attorney at the Frankfurt Square Park District for many years. I don't know how many, but it proved to be a wonderful relationship over the years. And Jim's unique in that he's not only an attorney, but he also is a CPA and has worked in both school districts and park districts. I think College of DuPage, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, College of Lake County. College of Lake County. So he's been an invaluable resource. And the best Jim Rock story I have is driving to Baltimore one day <laughs> and uh, getting the call about, why are you in a 403B? And everyone told us that was where we should be back in the day, being our account, our fidelity and auditor and everyone. And he goes, oh, no, 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 you should be in that. That's probably illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we're going to have to do is contact the IRS and self-report or something to that nature. Yeah. And I'm riding with my wife after being in our 403B for like ever. And she's saying, what does that do to our retirement? And I'm saying, I'm sure it does nothing. But it turned out to be, he turned out to be right. And after going through, I don't know, 10 or 12 audits and, you know, various accounting firms and various attorneys, Jim was the one to catch it. But on a brighter note, um, it was all resolved hey, relatively quickly, good. and we have um, a 457 you? set up, and in a timely fashion, we were back up and running. So we appreciate that. It's always an adventure. And it's not many times you can say your, your attorney or your accountant are interesting, but in this case, it was. Yeah. So we're glad if he retired and decided to come back just for fun to give us this presentation. Um, so with no further ado, I'll uh, introduce Jim Rock. Ken Blackburn's our, our board president. Um, I can't. But we can move on to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. And that was a, a interesting. Uh, nice to meet you. Great to meet you. That was a, a, a very interesting process that we went through there. Um, yeah, as, as Jim said, the longest career that I had was actually in park districts, um, starting as a recreation supervisor all, and then going through almost every job in the park district uh, over the years to um, later being the business manager and then the executive director. So for me, it's always really delightful to get the opportunity to come back and be with my park district colleagues. Um, it's not something that, uh, that I get to do as often anymore because, as Jim said, I'm, um, I'm mostly retired. I retired in full uh, two weeks before COVID hit and um, stayed that way for about eight months. And then some folks at the firm said, you know, maybe you should have something more to do. So I work a little bit uh, here and there, and, uh, and, and they, they, they keep me busy, uh, as busy as my wife uh, will allow. But anyway, it's great to be with you. Um, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. We're going to have a little bit of time, I think, or as much time as you want at the end for questions and answers, that kind of thing. But um, I've found it's better uh, if, as we go, if you have a question, let's stop and let's talk about it right then. Um, I don't have any, like, there's no problem with that in any way. Raise your hand or yell out whatever you need to do to get my attention. We'll stop and, and have a conversation about that because my um, experience is that if you have that question, it's likely somebody else has it as well, and it's better in context usually when we're talking about a specific um, topic that we kind of address that. So anything at all that comes up, um, just let me know. And with that, let's get started. So we're going to talk tonight about um, Park District finances, mostly the budget, budget and the um, and the uh, tax levy. So we're going to start with that. Um, we'll, we'll start with the levy ordinance and and the the, the tax property tax levy itself. And yeah. um, I I was looking at this slide and I thought, you know, yeah, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the call. Hello. No, it's Dennis. He's not muted. Okay. Hi, Dennis. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry for that. I'll mute. I'll be sure to mute myself. That's all right. No worries, but you can always unmute when you need to ask a question. Um, we started this, and I, as I was too. looking at this, as, as I was looking at this slide, I thought, you know, hopefully everybody in the room is of the age where they know what a record is. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I was thinking, yeah, there's probably folks out there that have never seen a record go around on a turntable, but we talk a little bit about it being like a record. It's always going around in the same direction. And, and it just reflects that, the, you know, really the budget process never stops. You start out with your early discussions, planning for the upcoming year, going through all the procedural steps and legal things that you need to do to adopt the budget. Then you spend the rest of the year implementing that plan, moderating, monitoring your revenues and expenditures, and then when, it, when necessary, making adjustments to it. And then long before that fiscal year has ended, you start it all over again. And I know the staff in particular can tell you that they feel like they're never not thinking about the budget. Um, it's just a, a, it's a project, a process that just really never stops. Hey, Jim. Yes. One thing we're missing desperately today is Linda. Uh -huh. And the thing I neglected to do is we need to call this meeting to order. Oh, my apologies. Then my fault. I've got my notes here and, and didn't do that. So with that But your attorney said, should have told you that. Yeah, well. <laughs> Connection to each other, but um, you, 
if you put too much detail uh, in the, in my opinion at least, in the levy ordinance, it gets confusing for people because they think they're looking at your budget and that's not what it is at all. It's simply an ordinance that allows you to collect property taxes for the specific purposes of each of your funds. And we'll get into a little more about that. So the source of authority for your property tax levies, um, there's a property tax fund maximum rate and statute reference. So this, the, the statute that we're talking about in this case um, is, the, um, is the park district code. And that's where most of the authority to, to levy taxes for a park district comes from the property, from the, excuse me, from the um, park district code. There are a couple others like, like Social Security and IMRF that come from those particular codes, but primarily the um, authority to levy it to the property taxes and the, the amount that they can be and the maximum rates, those statutory re references are all contained in the Park District Code. We say here, don't forget to read the statute. However, um, it's not a lot of fun to read statutes, particularly if you're not a lawyer. So it's, while, while reading it is, um, is not a bad idea at all, um, if, you, if you're looking for interpretations of it, give us a call. Because um, judges and, um, and courts uh, end up actually determining the interpretation of those codes. And we've had, we have experience in working in those situations and can usually respond to questions about it pretty easily. But it's good to see it, you know, just so you, you've had an opportunity to look through it. But if you're looking for interpretations, give us a call. Um, the, the website information that I've put on here is the Illinois Department of Revenue website. If you go to their main page and then you go to their information for property tax and then the next tab, which says tax information, and then the next tab, which says local officials only, um, you can get a good amount of information, not only about your property tax levies, um, but also um, other uh, property tax levies of, uh, or of pretty much everybody in the state at the local government level. Um, but I will say that over, they recently, uh, they, we, this slide used to have a different website listed on here, but they, they recently, that bold where it says local officials only, they've made that accessible only to local officials and you have to contact the Department of Revenue to get a permission to access that page. So, and, they, and the phone number is listed right on there. Um, so we discussed that, that the park district code is the primary source of authority for um, how, you know, the amount of taxes you can collect and how you go about collecting, but also there are limitations on how much property tax you can collect um, that, are, that don't come from the park district code, but actually come from the uh, property tax code. And um, the levies that you, the portion of the property tax code that governs what we're talking about next is called the property tax extension limitation law. And we all abbreviate it as PTEL. Um, you probably know it better as the tax cap. Um, that's, that's what that law is, is generally referred to. Um, and just to, to go through a little bit about the tax um, limitations that are, are established in that property tax extension limitation law. The, the taxes that you levy that are, well, you don't levy all of these. I don't think you have a museum or we don't. levy, right? Yeah, but these, these, are, these are authorized by the Park District Code. Um, but those, the corporate fund and the, the other special funds that are listed here um, are all subject to the property tax cap. So we'll get into how that gets calculated a little bit. But we're, we're going to do sort of a high level look at how it gets cal calculated. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the math tonight. It's, uh, this isn't the right setting for us to do that. Um, but the, 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 generally speaking, those are the, the um, funds that are subject to the tax cap. And then the recreation, recreation for persons with disabilities is not subject to the tax cap, nor is your levy.
lobby for debt service. Those fall outside it. So whenever when we're talking about the um, the tax cap and the limits on what you can levy, we're not talking about recreation for persons with disabilities or debt service. We are talking about the corporate fund, the recreation fund, your insurance fund, your audit fund, and paving and lighting fund. Um, and then uh, also up there, they're not listed there, but also our the IMRF fund and the, the uh, Social Security fund fall under the tax cap as well. So the ones that don't are those two at the bottom. Everything else, there are limitations based on the tax cap. As I mentioned, the tax cap is part of the property tax code, and that 35 ICS 218-185 is the citation where if you went on the Illinois General Assembly website and looked at the statutes and went to the property tax code, that's where you'd find the property tax extension limitation law. Um, again, one of those laws that um, you may not want to spend a whole lot of your time reading um, unless you want to stay up late some night and fall, and it'll help you fall asleep real quickly. But, it, you know, essentially that tax cap law was established to give voters the, the greater control over the rate of the growth of property taxes in non-home rule units of government. It doesn't affect um, home rule units of government. They have, um, I, I don't want to call it limitless, they have much greater uh, authority to levy taxes than non-home rule. And park districts are never uh, home rule. It's just, in Illinois, that's not something uh, that a park district can achieve or, or become. Um, if, except by referendum, it li limits the rate of growth by reference to the CPI. We'll talk a little bit about how the CPI factors into this, but it's not the only factor um, but, and the CPI being the, if I start talking in these like acronyms, stop me, but the CPI is the, the Consumer Price Index, and um, the tax cap operates by, re by reference to the CPI, but it's not the only factor. Um, all new taxes must be approved by referendum since, since the start of that, uh, that law. And what, what that means by new tax means a tax for a fund that you've never levied before. So, for example, you don't levy a museum tax. If the board decided we want to build a museum and we want to levy a tax to build it and operate it, you'd first have to go a, a separate tax to do those things. You'd have to first go to your voters um, and ask them to approve a referendum to allow you to levy that new tax. Um, that's different than you know, increases in the, the taxes that you already levy. So the, the um, property tax extension limitation law limits the growth of your tax rate to the lesser of 5% or the percentage increase of the CPI for the year preceding the levy. So the year preceding the levy uh, that you're about to enter into is 2020. And in December of 2020, the Department of Revenue posted on that website that's listed there, um, the CPI changed for the year 2020. It was 1.4%. So that's, the, that's sort of the starting point for the calculation of the tax cap. It's not the, it's not the end point, but it's, it's where we start. Now, um, the interesting thing, at least to me, I find it a bit interesting, um, is that uh, this year we've had a lot of inflation. And um, it says up there, the lesser of 5% um, or uh, the percentage increase of CPI. So the tax cap was uh, adopted in 1991. And since 1991, we have never had a CPI above 5%. Um, it's mostly been much lower. I mean, sometimes it's been, during those years, it's been less than 1%. Uh, a couple times it hit 4%, uh, but it's mostly been in the 2 to 3% range over all those years. Um, but for this year, not, um, well, I'm going to 
getting a little ahead of myself and talking about next year, um, which is, doesn't really concern us tonight, but it's something to think about for next year when, when we get to this point a year from now. The 2021 change um, is likely to, for the first time in, since 1991, to um, be more than 5%. Um, for someone who's old like me, one of the indicators, it's not the same calculation, but one of the indicators of the level of inflation is the increase in Social Security benefits that are, um, and, and the, um, in, the increase that they're scheduled for for 2021, based on this year's um, inflationary rate, is 5.9%. And so if the CPI is somewhat reflective of that, it looks like we may be above 5% next year, um, which is, in one sense, good news. It gives you a little op opportunity to, to levy a, a higher amount um, based on the CPI. But uh, on the other side, what it really means is that we're not keeping up with inflation because if, for example, the CPI is 5.9% and you can only levy 5% based on the CPI, you're falling behind because costs are going up faster than revenues. Um, but it, you're in the same boat as every other unit of government that's subject to the property tax extension limitation law. But again, that's getting ahead of ourselves. That's next year, but just something to keep in mind when you're, um, when you're going about the levy next year. We'll know that number by the end of December this year. Um, so, uh, or probably at least early January. So it'll be something that um, staff can start planning for in terms of budgeting and, and looking at the levy for next yeah. year. So, so theoretically, if we went back to the 70s in hyperinflation, you know, 13% inflation, too bad you only get 5%. Right. That's exactly that. That's exactly the case. If, if no matter how high inflation goes, you're never going to go above 5% in the yeah. in the Way in the CPI portion of this calculation. That could hurt, that could hurt a lot yeah. if there's any extended period. The tax cap wasn't in place in the 70s. No, no, no. 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 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. I get that. No. I'm just saying if we right. got to that point, no, that's right. Right. hopefully we never do, but yeah. that could hurt a lot. Yes. Over if it year. happened for several years in a row. One they, year we could live with. Right. But it could, it could be problematic if it happened. But, you know, the pain's going to be felt by every unit of local government that's not home rule, sure. at least in Illinois. But yeah, that's a really good point. And one thing that, like with our district, when we were established, if you wanted to establish a museum fund or be a member of IMRF, that could, be, could have been included in the original referendum to start the park district of which it wasn't. So that's why we, we were never part of that. But the other thing is, our district went and passed a corporate rate increase back in the day. I don't know, it was in the 90s, uh, after the water fight litigation. But that isn't forever. That degrades with the tax cap like everything else. So even though our voters approved, I think it's, uh, we were at 1.5% and they gave, or, or 1.5 and they gave you another penny. So we were at 2.5 for whatever amount. That degrades with the tax cap like any other portion of your budget. You can't recoup it forever. It's only for that period of time, which isn't fair, but whatever. It's true. It's true. So um, there's a way out of some of this, um, and, so, and the, uh, some of the ways out actually are very relevant to you um, right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that allows you to uh, go beyond that increase in the CPI when you make your property tax levy is the value of new construction that's been added to your the, the district's assessed valuation. And um, this year, in talking to Jim, um, you've got significant new construction on the east side of the district, um, and the truth and taxation or, uh, resolution that you're um, considering later tonight reflects that. You, you'll see the numbers actually reflect um, some of these large uh, increases in, uh, in assessed valuation due to new construction. Um, it does, it's not helpful just to have um, increases in assessed valuation based on existing uh, property, but new construction is very helpful. 
The other one that I don't know if this will impact you. I don't know if there, are there any tax increment financing districts in Frankfurt? Well, in the the one district? was the Mannheim Auto Auction was in a TIF, and that TIF expired, so we got a dramatic increase in Cook County. They're talking about establishing a TIF in that area too, but it hasn't been finalized, which would be not a good situation. Right. Tinley Park usually uses some form of a TIF to bring in infrastructure, but it's measured so it'd be for five, seven years oh, to pay for infrastructure and then expire. But the one in Madison was like for 24 years, we'd receive nothing until 24 years and then it would be all vote. But that never, I haven't seen that it's gone very far. But that whole eastern edge could be 20, 25% additional EAV to the district in the next five years. You know. That's fantastic. If you don't levy above the 105%, say you levy at 102%, and the, the tax cap was at 5%, you would lose the 3%. That's correct. So when we blow up our levy, we're trying to take into account any variable. So when you see it today, it's like 46% which isn't going to be likely, but we won't leave anything on the table, but it won't impact any resident because the resident will pay based on the previous tax bill and all that money. Right. And so um, one of the, in, in hearing Jim's description of the TIF, um, my recommendation is just that um, once a year, somebody on the staff call the county, and in your case, counties, um, and uh, just ask, you know, have any have any TIFs been developed? What, when, if so, when are they scheduled to expire? Are there any existing TIFs that we're getting close to the expiration date? Because as, as, as in Jim's example, where if the CPI goes up to 5% and your levy doesn't um, consider that increase and you don't capture that increase that year, it's gone. That year's gone, and you don't get that money. The same thing with an expiring TIF. It's, it, the way that an expiring TIF works is it's treated like new construction for one year, the year that it expires. If you don't capture that increase in assessed valuation that happens when a TIF is taken off the TIF rolls and not back onto the, the property tax uh, assessment rolls, um, if you don't capture it that year, it's gone forever. So just it's a good practice to just keep in contact with the county about TIFs, find out, you know, are there any out there? As Jim said, one of the problems is that once they're established, unless the, the municipality um, sets up and, and, the, and the, the, the entity that is um, benefiting from the TIF, um, unless they establish a shorter period, there, the statutory length of time for those things is 23 years. So you're waiting 24 years for the, any increase in assessed valuation to help you um, while, while that, that money's on the TIF. So to whom does the tax cap apply? Well, what's most important is that it applies to you. So that's the easy answer, um, and that's important. It also um, applies to, uh, since 1991, to all non-home rule governments in DuPage, Lake McHenry, and Will counties. Um, and it, it also, and Cook for that matter, I'm not sure why it has, that's left out, but Cook is also included in that. Um, in 1995, oh, there we go, that's why it was left out. It didn't happen until 1995 with Cook County. Um, and then other counties who have adopted it by referendum. And if you're interested um, that, uh, in seeing who's adopted it by referendum, that, that, that website that has the link is to actually has a, a map that shows all of the counties that are now under uh, PTEL, which is most of the state at this point. Um, there are still some that haven't, but not very many. So what does is, what is home rule mean? So home rule um, is a um, is a form of government in Illinois that happens automatically if your um, if your municipality is 25,000 people or more, um, and it can ha or it can be established by referendum. And essentially, what home rule is is that it gives that 
entity, and it's usually municipalities, but there are others that can be, it's just not park districts, that can be home rule. And um, it gives them greater power to enact ordinances, to enact taxes. Um, it, they, they essentially have any power that's not limited by the statute, like that the, that the legislature hasn't actually said and home rule, and we're superseding home rule power in this instance, so home rule entities still have to follow this. So they have tremendously more powers than non-home rule. And the, the, the most significant one, you know, the most evident and, and easy to see one is um, taxes. But it's, it's also, because uh, they're not, they're not only aren't they um, limited by the tax cap, they're also not limited by some of the other restrictions that exist on, on amounts of taxes that they can do and the types of taxes they can do. There are restrictions on the types, but less than for non home So that's, that's really the, the big difference. What was that population? 25,000. So when a, when, a, when a municipality it hits population size of 25,000 people, they can just elect to become home rule. They don't, they don't have to um, go to referendum. But if it's a smaller community, um, they can do it by referendum. I can tell you from, from observing this and actually living in a community that, um, that they tried to, there were less than 25,000 and they, the local government, uh, the local municipality went to referendum to ask the voters to do that. It's not easy to get residents to agree to that because you're saying, we really trust you to not go overboard with all these taxes, and you know, and that's a hard thing for people to say. If I'm not mistaken, one of the things that applies in home rule is sales tax, right? I mean, this, the yes. state's 6.25, right? And the municipalities can add that onto it, right? Like Cook County has 10 percent, right? Yeah. But most of them are seven or eight percent, and yep. they can add on to that, and if you're not home rule, they can't add on to that. Right. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, um, if you're not home rule, there are further limitations on how much you can do yeah. that. that yeah. I'd put it that way. Okay. But um, but there are other taxes, and certainly the property tax is one of them. That's, okay. the, that's probably the, you know, with the exception of the sales tax, that's probably the biggest one. But Cook County um, uses their home rule authority um, a lot. And um, and they establish taxes that lots of other communities don't have. Um, how? Okay, so again, this is where I, where I go back to my um, comment from earlier. There, there's actually a publication um, available from the Illinois Department of Revenue that goes through step by step of the actual calculation of the property tax cap and what your um, County clerk will do uh, in the spring when they have all the information that they need to um, actually determine how much tax they'll extend for you. Um, it's, it, it, I mean, it would, it's, a, it's a publication. I don't think it's the kind of thing we'd want to go through tonight. I don't think it would be interesting or helpful for you for me to do that. But I, th I do want to just sort of cover sort of what they do uh, to get to the numbers. Um, they determine a preliminary rate um, that's based on your original levy, and then they use the calculations we're talking about that, include, that the de denominator of the calculations include the CPI, they include the increase in um, uh, new construction and expiring TIFs and those kinds of things. And they go through a, a calculation and they come up with an aggregate, uh, aggregate rate. And if you're your, if your, I'm sorry, a limiting rate, and if your initial rate exceeds that limiting rate, then they peel back how much tax they will extend on your behalf. Great example is what Jim just talked about uh, a few minutes ago, and that is you're going to extend, uh, or you're, I'm sorry, let's be very precise with these words. You're going to levy uh, based on what the, the um, resolution says tonight, in your operating funds, 46% more than you levied last, than you, than you collected last year. We, right now, 
now we don't know how much the um, actual assessed value will increase because if those numbers aren't available yet. But you've got some big developments. You know there's going to be large increases. It probably isn't going to be 46%. You're going to get 1.4% based on the CPI, and then you're going to get another percent based on new construction. If, if it's 46% on the nose, you're prescient and really know, you know what's going on. It, it's not gonna, it won't be. It'll be something different than that. It'll probably be less than that, which is a good thing because you want to get you want to make sure you capture whatever it is. So you don't want to make your levy, you know, seven percent higher than it was last year, and find out that you've got seventeen percent new construction. You want to make sure you capture that money. So then what will happen is when we get to this point where the county clerks are actually applying these formulas and determining what your limiting rate is and what, how much you can actually collect. If you if your levy's higher than that, they're going to send a notice to the staff and it's going to say you need to cut $50,000. I'm just making up that number probably nowhere near one way or the other, but you need to cut this much from your levy. Now, the um, in the old days, the way that happened was um, then you'd have to, within a couple of days, respond to them and whatever. But now um, you pass, and most um, public entities these days in Illinois do, instructions to the clerk that tell them how to reduce the funds based on um, a, either a proportionate amount from each of the funds or a certain amount from corporate and then a proportionate amount from the remainder of the funds. And I've seen that you've done that in the past. You'll do it again. You'll do it again. So then automatically what will happen is they'll get to the end of their calculation. They'll look at this and they'll say, okay, this is what the Frankfurt Square Park District has asked us to do uh, if, if their levy exceeds the limiting rate. And then that's what they'll do. They'll establish the extension for your district and then send out the property tax bills to all your residents. And, and even after we receive that from the county, they'll still let you make final adjustments. So if there's too much money in corporate and you want to roll it into somewhere else, they'll let you as long as you don't exceed that limiting rate. So Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 mostly really reasonable about that. And I and I, I say that because I've had um, other counties than the ones that you're within that have done some wild things over the years, but not in Will or Crooks. And, uh, and like, as it says at the bottom there, if you don't tell them, then the statute says that they're to reduce it on a proportional basis. And we always try to leave corporate as healthy as possible because it can be used for any expense. Whereas, say, if it all went into paving and lighting, it would be identified only as and that's advice that I, I would give to any of my clients. Did you want that flexibility? The corporate monies can be used, corporate property tax monies can be used for any, cor any corporate purpose of the park district. All the, the, the other ones are limited to the specific purpose for which they've been levied. So if it's in paving and lighting or if it's in recreation or if it's in some other fund where there are limits on what that money can be spent for, it's it's more restrictive than if it's in the corporate fund. So there was a public act called 94-976 that um, automatically raised all fund-specific tax rate ceilings to their maximum statutory limit. And what that meant, there, there are two things. There is the, the statutory limit on uh, the um, the fund and the just the authority to levy that tax and would they so when this came up several years ago the corporate fund is increased to 35 cents and the, the recreation fund is increased to 37 cents per 100 dollars of assessed valuation what that did um, and continues to do is is kind of what Jim was referring to is um, you know, put more money in the two funds that have more flexibility to be 
used. Um, but even though those ceilings went up, that didn't increase the property tax cap calculations. It does, that didn't bring you more money. It just allowed you to put the money you were getting into different pots. And essentially, the two most flexible pots that you have are corporate and recreation. And so um, that act was helpful from that perspective. Um, and what we found is that um, you know most park districts are, are approaching that if they can. But if the if the tax cap limits their overall rate to something less than this, then you, you've still got to have enough money to operate the other funds as well. Um, before I want to before I go on to this, are there any questions about any of that before we move on? Everyone okay with that? Okay. The next part is, is still related to the tax cap, but it's or to, to the property tax levy, but it, it kind of goes in a different direction. Um, this is this is excess accumulation, and what that addresses um, is property tax objections, rate objections. Have you been subject to any of those? Sure. Okay, so you get the property, the soup that's yeah. there. Okay. Commonwealth others the prop, large property. Yes, yeah. that's it. So there's this um, area of practice uh, in Illinois in particular, because we have more units of local government than any state in the country. There is a, um, a practice of the law that has cropped up, and the, the um, attorney's whole practice is based on tax objections. And primarily, over the years, they've represented large clients like Commonwealth Edison, Home Depot, home, you, you, any like corporation you can name, be because because that's where the money is. Amazon will be there. That's where the money is, is in these large ones. But what we've seen, and then I, what I what what I've seen in the last few years is that um, they've kind of looked at it and said, well, why should we limit it to that? Well, let's take homeowners in on this as well. So we've seen. Tax objection suits that would normally have looked like, you know, ComEd and NICOR and uh, Amazon and these large Boeing or somebody like that, you know, large corporations now also include homeowners who sort of jumped on the bandwagon to try uh, and to get into these tax objection suits. And typically, what happens with these suits is that. Um, they they look at everybody's financial statements and they look at and when I say everybody I mean they look at all the units of local government in a community and they look at your audit and your financial statements and your budget and appropriation ordinance and your levy and and look for um, things they can attack and over the, you know over the long period of time the, the fund that was most attacked was the tort fund the your insurance fund the reason for that was um, Lots of public bodies were using those funds to pay salaries and do other kinds of things. And there's there's some circumstances where you can actually still do that. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, that's supposed to be used for risk management and paying for insurance. And so that was one they attacked. Um, but the other thing they attack is the um, is the amount of fund balance you have in a particular fund compared to the amount you're levying. And um, on here it says, familiarize yourself with the rule of thumb. Well, what is the rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is it, you need to keep your fund balances um, to an amount that doesn't exceed two and a half times the average expenditures for the prior three years. So <laughs> rather than trying to sort of ask you to figure We've out what We've never had that problem. Yeah, and most most places don't, but no. I'll tell you where it happens now. It happens in special recreation funds, um, and, and we've seen in a couple others, but that's that's one that's happening, and here's why. What we're seeing is like you, you have to have um, a plan in place for all of the projects that you need to do to comply with ADA over the next X number of years. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got one. We do. Yeah, everybody has it. And I'm sure it's there's enough projects in there to exceed your budget for 
the foreseeable for future, right? So what happens is a lot of districts and, and other public bodies, well, it's mostly park districts and municipalities that deal with that, is that they want to accumulate funds so that they can do some of these projects over the years. And remember, social recreation is not subject to the tax cap. So it's one of those funds where people will put additional levies and collect additional monies in, and then you start to build a fund balance in there that's much more than you're spending every year. Um, so when I talk about the two and a half times, here's, here's, what, here's the example of what that means. So let's say it's your special recreation fund and you've decided you need money to spend on your ADA compliance over the next X number of years and you start to accumulate funds in there. Just for simplicity of examples, let's say um, that your annual, the average annual expenditures for the last year are $100,000. So two and a half times that is $250,000. And all of a sudden, you've got a fund balance of $300,000. And you, it's, a legit, you know, it's a legitimate concept. Let's um, collect some money in there so that we can get some of these projects done. Well, these tax objection lawyers are going to go after that really quickly. Um, there's a way, if, if you ever find yourself coming anywhere close to this rule of thumb number of two and a half times, just call us. There's an easy way to um, deal with this, and it's a legitimate way. It's not just me saying, well, we can sneak around these rules, because rule of thumb doesn't mean anything to us. Um, but if you have a plan and you adopt um, an ordinance or resolution that says we we have a plan to spend money on ADA compliance in this, from the special recreation fund over the next X number of years, and we're going to start to accumulate excess fund balance there beginning now, um, and we pass something that shows that you've taken considered action and it, it's in place and there's a there's an actual need and plan for how that money is going to be used, we can get rid of the tax objection cases. So I don't bring that up because it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. And I just bring it up to be aware, if you ever get close to, you know, like, say, say you get up to the point where you're, you're, you've, you're collecting enough in one of your funds that it's two times your annual average expenditures for the last three years, give us a call. We'll help you address that. It's not just for a special recreation fund. It's for any of the funds. If that happens and you've got a, an actual purpose for those funds, we can do that. And is that only at the end of your fiscal year, or do they actually look at, like, all your monthly balances? Because obviously... Yeah, they won't look at your... They're going to look at fund balance at the end of the fiscal year because they're, they're not going to go through... Yeah, otherwise, I mean, you collect money... You get all your revenues at one point. Right. 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 Exactly. You're, be yeah, you're, get, you're getting, yeah. you know, 50% of your property tax revenues in two months. Right. Your fund balance might be way up. But, yeah, it's, it's the ending fund balance for the year. We've kind of reversed that, though, because, like, with all of our major projects, say we did our path system throughout the entire district. It's nine miles. We got it through a grant. And then we accumulate that as a, uh, an ADA compliance total. We do bathrooms, we do all these different projects, so rather than paying for them out of the special rec fund, we pay for them through the corporate fund, and then we use excess revenue in special rec to repay the corporate fund for money already spent. So we've already spent it on ADA compliant programs, and all we're now doing is repaying corporate for that expense. Okay. Um, this is uh, just to discuss referenda that would allow you to, and I don't, I'm sure you're probably not in the, the mode to spend, uh, to, to um, go off a referenda today. Um, I won't spend a lot of time in this, but just to let you know, there are um, some different ways to approach referenda. Um, the the uh, PTEL actually uh, was, this public act actually changed PTEL to um, require certain things in terms of the referendums, um, including um, some language that has to go in there, but also the form of the of the referendum itself. Uh, you can increase your limiting rate referen uh, increase your limiting rate by referendum uh, for up to four years at a time. 
Um, you can also uh, increase your extension limitation. So we've been talking about this, the tax cap. You can increase that limitation by referendum. And that can be done for any number of years. And then either one of those um, requires uh, specific language that we would work with you on if uh, you ever get to that point. Um, which one's better for you? It, um, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we would walk you through this if, if, if you decide to go for referendum. If you have high growth rates um, in assessed valuation, uh, you can more efficiently get increased tax revenues with a limiting rate referendum. And if you have slow growth rates, you're probably better off using an extension limitation referendum. Again, what we do is look at the situation as it exists um, at the time that you're looking at doing something like this. I don't get the sense you have any plans to do that anytime soon. So we won't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, so what other changes occurred from those? These are from the changes where we increased the corporate and rec fund um, limits. Uh, it allows money to float between funds from year to year. In other words, like from one in one year, you may increase your um, corporate fund levy up to the max, and the next year you might decide, well, we really need some more money in the audit fund, although that one's kind of a small one, or insurance fund, that kind of thing. It allows you to have the flexibility to do that. Um, and then also, um, what's expected Oh, this is the specific language on those referendum where you'd have to say in the referendum what's the expected impact on the average homeowner. Um, and again, that's just language that gets put into the, to the referendum itself. Let's switch to the Truth and Taxation Act. Um, that's relevant, I think we talked about, because you are actually taking action on something related to that tonight. Um, the start you do is for that process is that you estimate the amount of taxes um, and the aggregate increase, remember, includes everything except debt service and special recreation. And if you, uh, if that increases over 100%, 105% from the previous year's extension, you have to hold a public hearing on the increase. And I'm sure you'll be doing that. Um, and the language that's in your um, resolution tonight pretty much mirrors what has to go in the black box advertisement that you have to put in the newspaper prior to the hearing. Um, this law doesn't describe changes in the tax rate um, or impacts on individual homeowners. It's not intended to do that. It's just to say we're increasing the aggregate levy by more than 105% over last year's extension. Um, it's the actual amount that's levied that counts, not the estimate. That's kind of an um, important point. So you, you tonight are adopting an estimate. Um, but sometimes districts get to the point where uh, they get past the estimate State, they get past the hearing state, and all of a sudden they go, well, we really want to, or let's say we get next week, um, there's a special board meeting, and you decide that that estimate is too low. Um, or that the, the estimate that you made right now shows it's less than 105% more than last year's, and Next week, you say, you know what? We really need to increase it. We've got all these projects coming up and all this new construction. Well, it's the amount that you actually levy, not the estimate. So once once you get to a point where you know what your levy is, if it's different than the estimate and it's, it puts you up from not in the category of having to have a, a truth and taxation hearing into needing one, then you need to have one. It's the levy itself. Um, it's a, not a substantive cap on you uh, on what you can levy as long as you comply with the notice requirement and the hearing. Um, and then the hearing, uh, we need to make this estimate of aggregate levy available at least 20 days in advance of adoption of the levy, which I don't think will be any problem because you won't do it at least till next month, so that's right. 30 days. Um, you need to publish the black box notice 
of the hearing uh, at least seven to 14 days in advance. Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You need to publish it seven to 14 days in advance, not at least, it's gotta be within that window. So it has to fall within seven days or four, to 14 days in advance. It can't be earlier than 14 days, can't be later than seven days uh, prior to the, the hearing. Um, at the hearing, explain reasons for the increase. Um, that, you know, there's no statutory requirement for what that hearing has to be other than an opportunity for people to ask you questions about the levy. So um, I have clients and in, in, in my professional life as a, a, a chief financial officer at a couple of different places. Um, I've seen it done a lot of different ways. Um, when I, it, it, a lot of park districts, it's basically uh, the board opens the hearing, asks if anybody from the public is there, and if they do, do you have any questions? They might, and they'll respond to those questions. When I was at a college, we did a whole presentation that took, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, and then asked if people had questions. But neither one of those is wrong. Um, the the uh, the statute doesn't say how you have to do it. It just says you have to do it. Um, the, and the only other limitation is that that can't uh, happen at the same time as your um, budget, the hearing on your budget and appropriation ordinance. That, that's not um, at all actually relevant to you, but just good to know, but it doesn't affect you because your property tax levy has to be done in the fall and then filed in the fall. Your budget and appropriation ordinance is for your fiscal year, which we're getting into May at that point. So. Um, you don't have to worry about it, but just so you know, you can't hold those hearings on the same night. Never forget to file the levy. Um, this is uh, so important, I, I can't stress it enough. I, it probably sounds like I'm joking, but really, we, there are cases of public bodies failing to file their levy on time, and um, because they didn't, they didn't get any property taxes for that year. And that creates a giant mess um, it, 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 in terms of both, you know, the operational side of things, but you know, trying to find some level of funding from somebody um, is is very difficult. It's, it's just, it's just, don't ever do that. Don't let that happen, um, ever. Um, we say that this thing is deadline. It has to be filed by the last Tuesday in December. And of course, my recommendation is that you would never wait till that point to do it. You're going to adopt it much earlier than that. First Monday in December. First Monday in December. My thing is to file those ordinances at the two county clerk's offices that week and get it done. Because and the, the the reasons I always give people, you know, well, what's what are you concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about a lot of things. One, I'm concerned about weather. It's December. If you wait till December 27th or 28th and all of a sudden there's a huge storm and offices are closed and you can't get there, too bad. It's just, you're just not gonna get your money. And another one I'm concerned about is mistakes. We're, we're human. You know, if, if a week after you file your levy ordinance, you realize we made a mistake, there's something wrong with it, you can have a special meeting and fix it and, and submit a, an amended uh, levy ordinance. So that's my, you know, short speech on that. I just uh, don't ever put, allow yourself to be put in a situation where you haven't filed that levy on time. It's your biggest source of revenues, and um, it just you can't, you really can't operate for a year without that money. Okay. Before I switch to budget appropriations, are there any questions on that? the levy or the le levy ordinance or any of those kinds of things. Okay, let's talk about budgets. Um, just a few curious little sayings we've had over the years from folks about budgets. It's uh, good management's better than good income. It's clearly a budget. It's got a lot of numbers in it. That was by one of our presidents. <laughs> and uh, the light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off due to budget cuts. Mm -hmm. that was a, you know, 80s and 90s comedians. Even, right? um, this one, just do salt your finances, same as last time. This is just something that we always try to remind everybody of, but your district does a great job of, of not doing that. And, and what we're talking about there is 
you know, some agencies in the past have taken the approach, well, we're just going to do an across-the-board increase of 4% uh, for every expenditure in the district and not consider why. You know, we're just, that's what we're going to do. We're, we, we, the, all the programs we're doing are fine. All the activities that we do and the, the staffing and everything else, staffing levels and all, we're just going to increase at 4%. Obviously, it takes lots more thought, consideration, and, and work to get to a budget. Uh, this is another thing somebody left, gave us at one point is it's an orderly system for living beyond your means. Well, let's hope not. Um, preparation, preparation, preparation. Please be sure to spend, you know, all the the time that you need. As I said, it's kind of a year-round process. Um, make sure the presentation um, is, you know, uh, understandable, clear, gives the public the amount of information they need to, un to know to, to understand what, how their money is being used. And, and I keep using that word, their money, because it's their money one way or the other. Either it's through property taxes or they're paying user fees, and um, they should know what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Make it a team effort. Uh, you know, involve levels of staff that um, maybe not decision makers, but at least have co contribute to what happens at the district and, and can help in the development of the budget. Um, stick to the schedule, make sure this is done timely. We're gonna talk about the, the requi law, legal requirements for the, the um, adoption of the budget appropriation ordinance, but um, I, I wanna, I'll talk a little bit about there where I think we, we, have, we can do ourselves a disservice if we stick, if we give ourselves some of the latitude that we're allowed by the law, um, be be willing to review and revise your plans. You know, that maybe during the process, uh, you, something gets pointed out that uh, is different than we've done in the past, and let's maybe rethink some of what we're doing. Um, one of the things that some clients have come to do is, that particularly if they're undertaking a new project a capital project or a new program area that's significant to the to the district, a new golf course, a new ice rink, a new whatever, um, is to not only involve personnel um, within the park district, but also to get out there and talk to folks from special interest groups um, and influential citizens. It just, you never know uh, what valuable information they be, they be able to provide in terms of planning and helpful uh, understanding of the expenditures that you'll need and revenues. Your budget, um, you know, what is it? Well, it's a, it's a spending plan. Uh, it's meant to control expenditures and measure your revenues. And that, and that magic word that I guess cropped up quite a while ago now, but continues to be out there is to be transparent. Make sure people can really understand and see what it is you're doing um, and not that all, the only people who understand it are the upper level staff and the board. So let's talk about the, the ordinance itself. So the budget appropriation ordinance um, is the legal document that you prepare to um, allow yourself to expend the funds that you've collected, both the the uh, property tax levy and um, all the other sources of revenue that you have, like user fees and rentals and all those kinds of things that you get. Um, I've taken a look at your budget appropriation ordinance and like most, um, not everybody does it this way, but most everybody does, um, you have two columns in your, you have a budget and you have an appropriation. The budget is, represents your plan for the year. This is what we think we're going to receive. This is what we plan to expend. The appropriation sets the legal limit on how much you can expend in, the, in those funds without um, taking further action. So, um, for example, I'm going to just take a real quickly look at this. Um, this year's appropriation in the corporate fund is 1.5 $27 million, and the budget amount is $1.355 million. Um, that $1.527 that you've established as the, as the um, 
appropriation in a corporate fund is literally the legal limit on what you can spend in that fund unless you get to a point where you, under, you realize you're going to spend more than that. And we'll talk a little bit about what you have to do if, if that happens. But um, one of the things your auditors are supposed to do, and, and generally my experience is that they do a good job of this, but is to look at your appropriation ordinance and compare it to what your actual expenditures were and make sure that you didn't exceed those, or if you did, that you took the appropriate actions you needed to authorize yourself to do that. Um, the budget appropriation ordinance, you must uh, make a, uh, public, a, a copy available to the public at least 30 days before you take final action on it. Um, you need to hold at least one public hearing, and the public hearing notice needs to be published at least one week earlier. Now, different from the um, tax levy ordinance where they said, the truth in taxation hearing has to be between seven and 14 days. The notice has to be published between seven and 14 days. This is just a minimum. It's got to be seven days. It, you could publish it a month earlier if you want to. There's no, there's no um, precise window. It's just got to be at least seven days. Um, and then it has to be filed with the county clerk, and in your case, clerks. And it has to be filed before the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year has to be adopted before the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year, and it has to be filed before the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year. When do you usually do yours? Before July. So a month or so yeah. into the fiscal right. year. Yeah. yeah, and it, it, that's not that unusual. You know, ideally, in an ideal wor world, it'd be great to um, get it done before the fiscal year starts. The problem that I've seen and experienced myself is that when you're, when you're doing a budget like this, um, when you get, if you were, if you were able to, if you were going to be able to um, file it that early, if you, for example, before the fiscal year even starts, you'd have to adopt it uh, before you know the final results of your previous fiscal year. So that's why you get the latitude to go into the next fiscal year. But my recommendation is always to. Okay, you get that latitude, but don't stretch it to the last week. You know, um, try to get it done as reasonably possible, uh, as reasonably early as possible. But um, certainly, it has to be done before the first quarter of the fiscal year. So, we'll, um, a couple things. Like one, one question always comes up is, well, what happens if we don't? Well, technically speaking, if you didn't get that done prior to the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year. You could be subject to um, sort of legal attacks uh, by your your residents and taxpayers because at that point you're spending funds that you haven't been authorized to spend. Um, so, you know, going back to um, making sure things get done in a timely manner, you just don't want to ever have to face that. It's not something I've seen, I've, I've more read about it over the years because we just make sure that our clients don't put themselves in that position. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, that appropriation column on your budget appropriation ordinance is the legal limit on your spending. So what happens if you get to, you know, you've got a May 1 to April 30 uh, budget appropriation uh, uh, period, your fiscal year, and let's say we get to March and um, we've already spent $1.527 million in the corporate fund, what do we do? We, we still need to operate the last two months of our year. Well, there are a number of different um, procedures that you can follow depending on what it is that caused you to get to that point. Um, if you, in this case, we talk about unexpected revenue. If you get unexpected revenue, a grant, or um, a donation, or um, your golf course goes from what you thought you were going to get to 10 times that much because there's a new Tiger Woods and everybody wants to play golf again, um, or COVID, COVID <laughs> which really boosted golf course revenues. 
and you just and because of those increased revenues, you have all these extra expenditures. The the, the legislature has actually um, uh, established a way to do that. But the, typically, if when you get yourself in that situation, in order to amend the a budget and appropriation ordinance, you have to follow all the same procedures you did when you first adopted the ordinance, which means you have to um, put it on, make it available for presentation for uh, 30, I'm sorry, make, for observation for 30 days. You have to publish a notice of a hearing, you have to hold the hearing, and then you can adopt it. So it's a lot of procedural steps to do that. In this case, if it's because of unexpected revenues, we just draft an ordinance and um, post it on your agenda and adopt it. And that's easy. But if it's not for that purpose, there are more restrictions. Like I said, generally speaking, you'd have to go through the same process. Uh, but there are some other exceptions, too, where we can actually transfer <coughs> funds within line items in a fund to avoid some of those situations. And so if you, get, if you find yourself in a situation where you are going to, you think you're going to, or you have exceeded the amount of expenditures that you appropriated, in your budget and appropriation ordinance and you're going to exceed that legal limit, then give us a call and we'll help you pick which method is, the, is, is actually appropriate for you and also um, is the easiest and takes the least time. Um, the budget number is not a legal limit. The budget number is your plan. So it's that, that appropriation or a part of the ordinance that we look at. Um, Financial reports and audits. Uh, let's talk about those a little bit. Um, the um, annual audit, the state comptroller's report, and the annual treasurer's report. Um, this is real straightforward. You obviously spend more than $850,000 a year, so you have to do both an audit and a comptroller's report, and they both must be filed, must be completed and filed within six months from the end of the fiscal year. The um, audit gets filed with the county clerk. The comptroller's report gets filed with the state comptroller's office. Um, then there's this thing called the Public Funds Statement Publication Act, which is a statement of um, all your expenditures over a certain amount. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, all of the um, salaries that are paid by the district. That report, in years past um, had to be published in the newspaper. And it was really, uh, it's an extensive report and it's very expensive to publish. So in this case, after years of lobbying by IAPD and others, the legislature finally um, sort of stopped listening to the press lobby who were saying, well, we need that money. Um, and it was, it was particularly expensive, and nobody read it. Uh, so now, they, uh, it's effective now almost 10 years ago, uh, the legislature allowed us to publish a notice of availability of audit that can be published, and it just, um, I'll get into what it has to state, um, but you can publish that notice of availability. It's much shorter, much less costly to do, and we don't have to publish this whole report anymore. Oops. Um, let's talk a little bit about what has, so the, the notice availability essentially um, just talks about the, the, uh, the audit itself, tells it it's available for inspection if anybody wants to see it, and that has to be published in the newspaper. Um, there was a slide, I want to go back for a second. Like and we go a request from a specific group about information related to payroll and salaries every year that they post. I don't remember what the site is, but they post everyone's salary on it so they look up people kind of thing. So. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to if this is. Slide 33. Um, let's see what page it is. Yeah, it's page. Does everybody have that? 11. 
Okay. Um, I, there's a mistake on this, and I want to point it out and I ask you to cross it out because it, it's wrong, and I don't want to have, have you confused or misled or those. So in the second bullet point, it says, to the extent expenditures do not exceed unexpected additional revenues, no requirement to follow truth in taxation posting and notice requirements. Anybody have an idea what's wrong with that? It's okay if you don't. <laughs> it's my error. So this, this has nothing to do with truth in taxation. This is budget and appropriation. So we're not talking about taxes. So what, I, what it should say is that there's no requirement to follow the posting and notice requirements. So if you would, just cross out the words truth in taxation. That's, it, that's just wrong. It, that has nothing to do with this. Okay, now. Um, before we get to more general questions, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a minute. At the back of your handout, you have a, an IAPD calendar. And they publish this every year, their legal calendar, and they publish it every year, and I'm, I'm glad they do. Oh, sorry about that. Has everyone got that? Yep. Okay, so it's the IAPD legal calendar. I'm just going to... Um, Jim was kind enough to highlight some areas on here, and I want to go through those, and I, I've got one actually I'll start with that's not highlighted, but it's a good one just to make sure everybody's aware of. So on page 14, at the, at the bottom left of these, there's page numbers. Page, it says page 14. Um, January 31st, that one's not highlighted, but it's really important. This is the last day to file with the Chief County Assessment Officer for all tax-exempt real estate an affidavit slash certificate of exempt status stating whether there has been any change in the ownership or use of the exempt real estate and the nature of such change. Um, what that's about is you own a number of properties, including the one we're sitting on right now, that are exempt from property taxes. And the state requires you every year to submit to the assessor in each county a list of the pins of, that are exempt and if there are an, an, an explanation of whether there have been any changes in use. And what they're looking for is, did you sell it? Is it now all of a sudden being leased to somebody else and used for some non-exempt purposes, in which case they need to establish what's called a leasehold pin, and then they establish an assessment and property tax for that non-exempt user. I, I don't think that you're doing any of that, but it's a common practice, frankly, in, in park districts. Um, and the reason you need to do that is because if you don't, and, and, you, and you don't realize that they've taken an exempt pin off that list, um, it causes complications that can get expensive where you're going to have to involve lawyers to get the exemption back again. So it's essentially what it is, is there's a one-time application for the exemption, and this process allows that the exemption to continue to go on and on as long as you're continuing to use it for exempt purposes. I know it's not budget or tax levy, but it's probably one of those really important things that just to be aware of that's out there. The next one is that um, April 5th date. It says the suggested date to prepare the budget and appropriation ordinance in tentative form and place on file for public inspection at least 30 days prior to final action. That is based on a May 1 to, to um, April 30th uh, fiscal year like yours, but it's, it's suggested date. It's not a requirement. As long as you meet the uh, the end date requirements, which is to have that adopted, that ordinance adopted and uh, filed with the clerk, clerks um, by the end of the first quarter, you're fine. But that, it's good to know roughly that's about the time you should be thinking about. Yeah, we put we approve on. our budget in before May 1 okay. in April, but the budget appropriation is prepared until June when we've got final numbers. Right. And that's like that. just fine. Oh, sorry. Okay. Maybe I'm not talking enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, if we yeah, really. <laughs> so then, 
then if we go to the next page, uh, 15, with, um, we have a couple highlights there. May 20th, uh, as they recommend at the regular board meeting that you hold a public hearing on the budget appropriation ordinance and the date for enacting the ordinance. Again, as long as you're familiar with the fact that it's got to be adopted by um, the end of the first quarter, that's just a recommendation from the state, it's, uh, from the state association. It's not a requirement. Um, June 18th, last day for filing a copy of the district's budget and appropriation ordinance with the county clerk, as well as a certified estimate uh, of revenue by source. That is actually the date that, that needs to be done based on your fiscal year. Um, regular October board meeting, review your non-referendum bonding needs um, in preparation for selling bonds before the close of the calendar year. Do you issue bonds? We did this year. Okay, and it's done. It's done. So we've already, you're ahead of their calendar, yep. which is a good thing. Um, next page, we have um, October 21st. I love this. October 21st is the suggested date for the board to determine the amount of money estimated to be necessary to raise, be raised by the tax levy ordinance and determine whether you'll need a truth in taxation hearing. And it's October 21st, and you have that on your agenda for tonight. Yep. So you met that requirement, right, on the date that they recommend it. And again, it's not, that's, tonight's not the required night, but this is the time that you want to be doing that. November 8th, the suggested date to publish notice of your um, truth and taxation hearing. And um, I'm not sure if you'll do it exactly on that date, but somewhere around there. Right. Yeah. And um, November 18th, suggested date to hold the hearing pursuant to the truth and taxation. Again, um, that, that you don't have to do it that night, just sometime before you actually, uh, and you can, just so no lack of clarity with that, you can have the budget appropriation hearing, I'm sorry, you can have the truth in taxation hearing on the same night that you adopt the tax levy ordinance. Right. So there's, the urgency to do that on November 18th um, isn't there. It's, you can do it both, both of those things on the same night. Um, and then they're saying, they, and they show that because they're saying they're suggesting that you enact the truth of tax levy ordinance uh, at the same night as the truth and taxation hearing. It's just you probably won't do it on November 18th. Um, December 1st, uh, suggested date to verify that for real estate inquired in 2021, you've applied, you've submitted the applications. Um, for tax exemption to the uh, appropriate board of review, either Will or Cook County. And I know that I've done at least two of those for you this year. Right. So um, I know your staff is keeping up on those. Um, December 1st, suggested date to confirm that a certified copy of the levy ordinance was properly filed. You probably won't do that by December 1st, but sometime shortly thereafter. And again, you want to give yourself enough time, so if there are any issues or problems, uh, that you have time to fix them. And then um, December 3rd is just sort of the, the last day to publish a truth and taxation notice um, if you enacted, the, oh, okay. So this, this gets to, this is an interesting one. So December 3rd, remember what I said about truth and taxation that what's important is what you actually levy, not what you estimate you're going to levy. So what this refers to here, this December 3rd, is that if you published, uh, if you levied more than 105% of last year's extension and, you, and it was more than what you estimated, you, you need to still have a, a truth and taxation hearing um, it says notice must be given within 15 days of the date the levy ordinance was enacted. So if, if you were to get in that situation, then you're not going to, but that it gives you an out if that happens, if it exceeds the estimate, there's a way to, to uh, address that. Um, December 17th is suggested day by which bond ordinance should be filed with the county clerk. Uh, I'm assuming that's already done. If you've already adopted it, it's probably already been filed. It is. So that's great. Um, and December 28th uh, is the last day to file your levy ordinance. And we're not going to wait till then. 
Um, one thing, just back up to that December 17th date uh, about the um, uh, in filing the bond ordinance. Just as sort of an aside, uh, just you may wonder why the uh, budget. I'm sorry, why the tax levy ordinance doesn't include a levy for bonds because you're going to have bonds. The reason for that is that the bond ordinance itself is the levy ordinance for the bonds. It actually contains language in your bond ordinance that directs the county clerk to levy the amount needed for that. The reason for that is because um, nobody wants, uh, bondholders don't like to not get paid, let's put it that way. And so they, there's not a reliance on public bodies to include that levy in their, in their um, tax levy ordinance because you made the decision and established the amounts that will be levied when you adopted the bonds. And so that goes to the clerk right away, and that's what the direction is for them to um, levy the, the debt service ex, um, extension. The, um, I have seen districts that do include it in their levy ordinance. I find it it's unnecessary and it's also confusing to the clerk, so I just don't, don't do that. Questions? Any? I was hoping you could talk a little bit about a resolution versus an ordinance and how they differ. Um, primarily in terms of parts of the, it, well, for municipalities, the statutes um, in particular state that almost everything they do has to be done by ordinance. And so they avoid using resolutions for most um, actions. For park districts, it depends on the language in the statute. Um, there are some items that say this must be done by resolution. There are some provisions in the in the park district code that say it has to be done, done by ordinance. And so we do what they say. The effect of them is the same. I mean, if they're they're legally binding actions of the board, whether it's a resolution or an ordinance, except that if it says ordinance and you don't do an ordinance, someone could call that into question. But, I mean, they're, they're, um, the authority that they grant to whomever they are aimed at, so like if it says it's an ordinance that authorizes a certain action, um, typically what we're going to do is look to the statute that gives the authority and do it either as a resolution or ordinance, whatever they say. It hits the dates 
you just you know know that where it says suggested, it doesn't have to be that date, but that you, you that you know it should be somewhere around there. So if you get to if you get to um, for example June 1st, and you haven't seen a budget appropriation ordinance. You know, the antenna should go up and you should be asking staff, where's that ordinance? I guess I would always look at it as the board's ultimately responsible for it, but the board hires the staff to do all the stuff. Right. right. And, and if right. the staff doesn't do it, then we fire them and give people that will do it, yeah. right? But we have really good people that do all right. the stuff that they need to do. You do. And, and the thought process is we do a lot of things because it's historical and it's paint by numbers. And we kind of brought Jim in this year so that we can have a better understanding of why we do things and share that with more staff so that, you know, it's not one or two people that end up on the hook for this. There's more people that are aware of it. Because in recent history, we had an incident where a guy that did a lot of stuff for us wasn't available. And we were scrambling to figure out how, how it worked. And it all worked out fine. But we just didn't want to be in that situation. So there's more people aware of it than Linda and I. And so that's a good thing, you know. Good. Thank you. Other, oops, any other questions? We're here to. So Dennis has a question when it comes to times. Is it my question? time? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Awesome. Thank you for the great presentation. A lot of this stuff is very new to me, but my question is, is, and I think you just touched on some of it there, but in your opinion, what makes a good board member with specific attention to being good stewards of taxpayer dollars? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and actually, I, you know what, I actually have a document that um, IEPD publishes that, that kind of goes through that, and I'll be glad to send it to Jim to distribute to all of you. It's, I think it does a really nice job. But, I, I, you know, for me, I think it's understanding that, you know, you, you do have a responsibility to the taxpayers um, to, you know, to, to carefully look at the materials that you're provided, to read the board packets and ask questions um, if, if you don't understand it, or even if you do understand it and you want to know more about what's there. Um, I, you know, I... I I've had board members in the past who um, basically grilled staff uh, about things, and, 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 I mean, and I mean in a positive way, but they asked lots of questions. And I, I feel like the more informed you are, um, the better it is. Uh, sometimes those questions can be best answered by just a quick call to the director. Um, and, and a lot of times, one of the things I always appreciated uh, as a chief financial officer was if it was a question about a bill, um, you know, sure, you can ask it at the board meeting, but the, that doesn't give the staff opportunity to look into the question and really give you a, 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 an answer that's thorough. Um, so that's, the, those are like bills are one that I always recommend. And give them a call. Give them, give them a heads up. I've got, I'm going to have a question about this. Could you take a look at it um, before? And, and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you don't have time before a board meeting or those kinds of things. But um, if you can, you know, do. But um, as far as the finances, you know, uh, being a good steward, you're absolutely right. Make, you know, ask the questions about um, about how the finances are are being uh, operated, how the, what kinds of expenditures, the revenues. Uh, be informed about what's going on, how the money's being used. Read everything you get. Um, if if there's if there's one thing that I have always valued, uh, it was prepared board members, people who came into the meeting knowing what we're talking about tonight, um, understanding, um, you know, what the, what, what the issues may be as, as they relate to it and, you know, participating in the discussions. Uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing that I think is really helpful. And, and then also just understanding your role because um, it's important to understand uh, while it's good to ask questions, it's good to be informed, it's good to be on top of what's happening in the district, um, it's not your role to, um, to be involved in the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Your role is to, you know, think of, to to work together to establish a budget that the, the staff is required then to stick to and to 
uh, fulfill all the requirements of the operations and those kinds of things. And you make policies and you, uh, you know, and sometimes based on their recommendations or sometimes based on board initiatives. Um, but you're, you're here to make policy, make, uh, adopt the budget, adopt the ordinances and, and policies and procedures uh, that need to be implemented and then expect the staff to meet the goals and objectives and mission of the district. I hope that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. Any other questions? I think this has all been really worthwhile. And uh, I appreciate you coming out. And I, and I do appreciate the board coming out, too, because it just makes it a lot easier if everybody's on the same page. With that being said, I think we could, if it's okay, adjourn this meeting, take a break, and then uh, we'll come back in at 7.30. So I need a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Joe Vlosic, seconded by. Second. Uh, roll call. Are all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There we go. We're all set. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very much. And board members, if you want to go into Audrey's office.